Oh, I'm so glad that you joined, decided to join us here today. This is the Tuesday after Pentecost. What an exciting time to be alive. We live in the season of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to do something a little bit different today for a Bible study because one of the things that you might have missed in church on Sunday, probably didn't even mention it on Sunday, May the 31st is the celebration of the visitation of Mary. And you're like, what in the world? Well, usually that doesn't fall on Sunday. It only falls on Sunday once every seven years. This year it happens to fall on Pentecost Sunday. And so we didn't even celebrate in our church because Pentecost took precedence. So I am going to read to you the celebration of the visitation of Mary today. And that's what we're going to do for a Bible study on this Tuesday in the season of Pentecost. And so let me read to you the lesson. This is from the Gospel of Luke, the first chapter. Now at that time, Mary got ready. She hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered into Zachariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice she explained, exclaimed, Blessed are you amongst all women. Blessed are the child that you bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? So as soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed is she who, he, it is she who has believed that the Lord will fulfill her promises to her. So Mary said in response to Elizabeth, this is beautiful greeting. My soul glorifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been merciful on the, of the humble state of his servant. From now on all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their innermost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things. He has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and to his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Mary then stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and returned home. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to her son. Here ends the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we are thankful for this beautiful lesson for today. And I am so grateful for this story, the story of the visitation of Mary. I just give you thanks and pray that you would, O oh God, inspire us with this lesson. For he asks us all in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a little bit of background about this celebration. I know, again, as I said, you probably, you might have lived your entire life and never heard of the celebration of the visitation of Mary. You're saying, what in the world is this all about? Well, you know, obviously we don't know exactly when Jesus was born. We celebrate it on December 25th. He most certainly was not born on December the 25th. But we count back from there and say, okay, when in the calendar if Jesus were born on December 25th, when would uh, Elizabeth have given birth to uh, John the Baptist? And when would Mary become pregnant? So we have all of these celebrations that are, again, artificial in one sense, but they're ways of commemorating these significant events in the life of the church. And so this one is the commemoration of that day when Mar Mary, the mother of Jesus, while she was newly pregnant, came to visit with her cousin, Elizabeth. And Elizabeth, and you heard the lesson for today, Zechariah, by the way, is still silenced. Remember, Zechariah was doubting the, the word of God when the, uh, when the angel came to him and told him that his wife, who had been long barren and unable to have children, would be giving birth to his son. Um, and so he was still silenced. He said, well, as evidence of that, you're going to not be able to speak until the birth of your son. So Zechariah was still silenced. Mary again heard that wonderful news that her aging, once barren cousin was now pregnant. Oh, by the way, if this story sounds kind of familiar, like an Old Testament lesson of Abraham and his wife Sarah, you're kind of supposed to think that. We are intended to reflect upon the Abraham and, I, and, and, and Sarah story and how they gave birth at a very late age in life to a baby boy named Isaac, whose name means laughter. So yes... You're not going crazy if this story sounds familiar. 
the difference is there's a big twist in stories between the Old Testament lesson of Abraham and Sarah and the birth of Isaac and the New Testament lesson with Zechariah and Elizabeth and the birth of John. We are meant to notice this. In the Abraham story, it was Sarah who laughed when the angel came and revealed this to them. She did not believe. Here's the twist. In the New Testament story, it is the man. In the Elizabeth story, it's the man, Zechariah, who did not believe. And we are told that when Mary comes to visit with Jesus or with uh, her cousin Elizabeth, Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, that may not be as jaw-dropping amazing as you may think it as as you're hearing it right now. But I want you to imagine a patriarchal society in which the only people that they had ever known had received the gift of the Holy Spirit were men. And now you've got this woman, Elizabeth, receiving the Holy Spirit and prophesying in the name of God. Now, I'm not saying it didn't happen, but that was a unique and wonderful event. It would be shocking. So I want you to put your thinking cap on and just think about why this lesson is included in the Bible. I mean, outside of the fact that, yes, we believe it's, it happened, but I want you to know what's the motivation of God to make it happen this way. I want you to recognize the preeminence of women in the story of Jesus' life. Oh, I'm going to hold up another sign. I want to shock some people. Some of you might actually get ticked and stop listening. That's okay. Take a look at this. Do you see what this says? Take a look. Read it. I'll give you a second. It is in Jesus that God tears down all the walls that have been built up by men to diminish, alienate, and oppress women. Did you see that? In Jesus Christ, God tears down all the walls that have been built by men to diminish, alienate, and oppress women. I am convinced that that is the reason why this story is right at the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, because Luke is trying to tell us God is doing something radically different in Jesus. Obviously, obviously, it's a gift of Jesus, but notice that the gift of Jesus, the gift of God's love is coming not through men, but in this case, through women. The women are the true believers. They're the ones who carry the most important message of all. No, not Moses, not Abraham, not Isaac, not David the king but a humble woman named Mary, another humble woman, her cousin, named Elizabeth, have the most important message of all. They are the true believers. The message in this case, our New Testament, was not carried by men, but by women. And, the most, and, the, and this is the thing that I need you to understand. If you read the Gospel of Luke, the most important tasks are always given to who? If you want it done right, Give it to a woman. It was Mary Magdalene who was the first evangelist of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Not a man. Not Peter. Not Paul. Mary. So I want you to think about the Old Testament compared to the New Testament. It wasn't Moses, Abraham, or God. You know, let me put it another way. Hey, Moses, Abraham, and God, they're no Mary and Elizabeth. You want to know who stands preeminent? Mary and Elizabeth. Well, actually, Jesus. But Mary and Elizabeth, and there's a reason for that. Moses, David, Abraham, they've got nothing in compared to Mary and Elizabeth. We celebrate the men of the Old Testament. That's great. But Jesus restores women to their rightful place. So then we have this Mary's song, and I love Mary's song. She recognizes that she is not the greatest, the best, the brightest, and it's not her greatness that makes this possible. She understands that she is God's choice, and it's not because of anything that she's done. She has humility, something often lacking 
in the men of the Old Testament. She is so unlike Moses. She is so unlike Abraham. She is so unlike David the king. See, all of these men that I just mentioned, they struggled and wrestled against God. Moses, he was a whiny little boy who gave into the materialistic demands of a people. Oh, they're so whiny, God. Why don't you just take me now? Oh, they're just whiny. I guess I'll strike this rock and, and make water gush out of it because these people are so whiny. Oh, God, maybe we'll just melt down some metal. Let them make their molten lead, molten, uh, molten golden calves and stuff like this that they can worship. He was a whiner. Moses was. Abraham, do you remember what Abraham tried to do? Oh, that's right. When he heard the good news that he was supposed to have a child, he tried to make it happen with a, a servant of his. He didn't trust God to protect him, so he lied about the identity of his wife. Little putz. David, oh, what did David do? David was told God would make God would make a great and mighty nation of him. Guess what David did? He decided to try to take it into his own hands. That's right. He made a great army. He taxed his people to death. He intentionally killed one of his generals because, uh, so that he could take the general's wife as his own. He surrounded himself with wealth and with women in order to demonstrate his power and his status. He was a long way from the humble shepherd boy that we first met when we first met him. These men tried to do something about the command of God. They tried to make it happen. But guess what? The women of the New Testament, Mary and Elizabeth, they didn't try to make it happen. They submitted themselves to God and they said, Okay, God, we are your faithful servants. Do according to your will. And they got out of the way and they let the Spirit move. Mary and Elizabeth are much more faithful representations of service than Moses and Abraham and Isaac and Elijah and Elisha and Solomon and any great prophet you can name in the Old Testament. These two women far exceed, uh, are, are, are far exceed in their faithfulness to God's calling upon their lives. So, here's my point for today. God's ultimate plan of salvation for all of humanity is established through the faithfulness and the submission of two faithful women, Mary and Elizabeth. They did something men could not do. Ah, see, because we men always want to prove ourselves, always want to establish ourselves, always want to put our noses in. But these women show us the true way of the kingdom of heaven. We submit out of reverence to Christ and let God do the work. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that you reestablished through Jesus Christ the status of women as a partner of men. And we have so much that we need to learn. I know this story is really about Jesus Christ. But there's a secondary point that I believe that Luke was trying to communicate to us and that you were trying to communicate to Luke. That is through these faithful women, not men, that this new kingdom would be established because they were obedient servants. And so God help us men to learn from these faithful women the value of submission and the value of obedience. For he asked us all in Jesus' name. Amen. May God's blessing be upon you. And may God send you forth in peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace.